Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday, November 10th, and it is time again for the weekly Knowledge Bullite Hangout sponsored by Toperspin Meteorites. We have a topic today of eukrites. We're going to do a deep dive into eukrites scientifically and where they fit on the meteorite classification uh, chart. We have Mike Kelly doing that presentation for us. We also have a plethora of international videos today. So we have Marco, Maxime, and uh, Damian all submitting fantastic videos. So we're going to look at those, and one of them is going to, they're all eucritic based. So everything tonight is going to be basically eucrite, except for a few random show and tells. So with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to anyone who has some show and tell. And I see that, oh, good. Chris Monk from Rocks on the Ground is in the building. Unfortunately, he's been working his butt off week after week, and now he's with us. Yeah, it's good to be back. Um, it's a bummer that I can't hang out this time of the year. And it's a bummer that you guys were talking about stuff that I've recently acquired. And mm. so last week was Howardite week. And Ooh. so I recently, I didn't have any real Howardite, like officially classified um, Howardite. So I did pick this one up. Man, that's beautiful. Nice, nice, nice. big slice. I love the white class in it. Those are those are pretty dominant there. Yeah, it's very. Oh, yeah. It's definitely the the rubble pile. I was looking <laughs> through it with an eye loop, and there there's some what look like uh, carbonaceous inclusions, some other big white class. Um, it's just it's just a pile down in there. Yeah, and like you were talking about the carbon. Can we see it one more time? You were talking about yep. like possible carbonaceous class. And that would possibly be like right by your thumb, those two little ones and that big black one. Those mm -hmm. would be the possible carbonaceous class. And then, oh yeah, right there, dead center. But yeah, there is a, it, that's a breccia for sure. There's a bunch of stuff in there. Thank you. Then I also picked up this little guy, Sakote Alin, but mm. nice. Nice, nice little lip, lip on that. Yeah, Great lip it's almost dripping oh let me get it out of there it's right here on the end it's almost got like a drip wow of a lip on there that's sweet. but nice oh yeah look lines. at that oh wow Ready. wow that is so cool and um my wife actually taught me a meteorite fact this past weekend the most tonnage of meteorite ever fallen uh in a witnessed fall is sakota lynn um, here's another recent acquisition to add to my lunar collection. The nice. Starry Night Lunar yes. 13951. Wow. And do you have metal flakes in that one? Um, I saw like about two or three. If I hold it just right, do you see one on the right side right there? Yeah. Yeah. Can, yeah. Right. Right there. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here, let me do this. This will be better. Oh, we're going to bust it out. Nice. <laughs> there we go oh wow that's oh, gorgeous wow. that one's got a nice polish on it too absolutely Whoa. oh yeah wow. you can see him flash dude yeah. that's gorgeous that's a complete slice isn't it yes it's got that the, is super that cool thick. wow and that's the unpolished side but that is gorgeous man I yeah. wanted a piece of that one for a while and finally I with me working so much, I had a little bit of extra money to finally pull the trigger. And then I showed this one before, not Whoa, during a hangout, but in the, like after <laughs> show. Oh, uh, that's one of the new ones from uh, BBA. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Fabulous. I'm jealous. I, I want that. <laughs> yeah. I, me too. I, <laughs> this is the only piece of Ben Cubbin I, I own, and it's from Arizona, so. I could not let this nice. get by. Yeah. Mark wow. Lyons? Um, yes. Yeah. That is that is so choice, dude. There, and there's not many pieces around that are cuttable. So um that I've seen. So that's that that are affordable, I should say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. anything with yeah. money, yeah, that solves a lot of problems, as Pat says. But no, that is a gorgeous, uh, super. I wouldn't say super affordable, but on the affordable size, because that's like, I want to say 500, 600 bucks a gram for that one. It's so rare. Yep. 
yeah that that's a really nice collection edition buddy that is all i have as far as my non ukrite show and tell us for today awesome man well that is super cool i i like that ben covenite a lot i i'm a little bit uh I'm a little bit uh, jealous about it myself because I, I <laughs> bought one sight unseen. I just wanted a sample of it. I knew I didn't want to really invest in it. Um, I just wanted it for my Arizona collection. And obviously it's super cool to have, but I just, I just got a very unimpressive piece. And I look at yours and I'm just like, <laughs> 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 time to change out the goatee. <laughs> hey, we have uh, Pat Brown. We'll go to him real quick. And it looks like he has a very low type con. Whoa, super low. Wow. Type. Yeah, so that one is an LL 3.05. Well spotted, Topper. This one is. Uh, is there you go. That's sharp. Particularly colorful. Absolutely. No doubt. That's a rainbow. <laughs> I had been lusting after one of these for quite some time and uh, pulled the trigger on an order with Poland Bet and Marcine mm -hmm. delivered the goods. And speaking of which, dun 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 Wow. Massive CAIs. That's this is NWA uh, 6254. I'll send you notes to her. Uh, this is a CK3. Wow. And that giant thing is a CAI of some sort or mm. possibly an amoeboid olivine aggregate. Wow. Yes. Someone's like been doing CAI some research. <laughs> that puppy is 15 millimeters across. Wow. Guys, look at it compared to the size of the chondrules in that 3.05. <laughs> <Yeah>, right. <laughs> is there some uh, barred structure in the middle of that, Pat? Um, there are. I, I think they're olivine laminella or plates. They're they're not. And of course, you know, we can't we can't see them in transmitted cross polarized light to see if they're all in the same crystal orientation. But I suspect they're not. I just got this one and and definitely learning more about it. And we were talking, too, about porosity and chondrules in the pre-hangout. And uh, this one displays quite a bit of that. All the little little black dots mm -hmm. are, uh, are pores. While this one is not a subtype, it's just a CK3, it is, uh, it's interesting that the, uh, that the porosity and the chondrules seems to go with primitiveness. Wow. That is really a beautiful, odd-looking slice. It's a pretty big slice. Oh, it's a, it's a big slice, yeah. yeah it, it's only 20-some-odd grams, but it, it's fairly thin, and, you know, being a carbonaceous, it's low density, and uh, so there's, there's a whole lot of surface area goodness. Oh, boy. Speaking of surface area goodness, <laughs> uh, this one is one of my favorite meteorites on the planet. This is NWA 4560. Wow. Marcin had a couple of slices that have been on his website for years. I finally pulled the trigger on. That is remarkable. Yeah, That's this one cool. is an LL 3.2. It's just chondral city. It's got a lot of compound chondrals in there as well. Mm -hmm. It does, yes. And there's some classy sort of things. This one yeah. here is really interesting because there's, you know, there's little chondrules floating around in it. And look look at the black one just um, right of center. I see the one you're talking about. There it's you really, go. That, that's it there. Uh, but yes, uh, it, it, th this one has some interesting black things like that. It also has some things that I think are probably carbonaceous inclusions. It's got a gob of whoa, uh, a gob of bleached chondrules. Uh, yes, this thing is really interesting. There's another one of those little guys with uh, with very very black matrix. Then down over here is another really interesting one of those bits with the black with a very black matrix. But yeah, this this is one of my favorite rights. Wow. And, uh, uh, some of the stunning photos that Marissa has uh, 
has posted are from NWA4560. Oh, nice. You give her something that beautiful to work with and she can work even more wonders with it. There's uh, black ring chondrules in there. There's bleach chondrules in, in that one black area in lower yeah. center. There's a yeah. line of chondrules. Just whoop. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You could definitely get lost in that. Yeah. So there's only 400 grams of this stuff. I just added 100 grams to the collection with two of these slices. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I just, you had mentioned bleached chondrules. Uh, we discussed that a little bit in the past, and I was kind of curious. Um, from what I remember, those are uh, due to aqueous alteration in the original meteorite, but uh, they they seem to be kind of here there here and there in the in the overall stone, but not. It, it's not like a swath of them all in one area. So I was just curious if do specific chondrules react differently to water? Is that why we only see occasional bleached chondrules in an otherwise unbleached surround? Or is 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 it like reassembled and there was an aqueous alteration in a prior history? Do, do we know how that works? Yeah. So uh, And also I'll ask as well, why not are they around the perimeter of the stone? Huh? Yeah, you know, I'm not a planetary scientist and I don't play one on TV or YouTube. But my understanding from my reading is that the, the bleaching of the chondrules is preferentially in the pyroxene chondrules. And the bleaching process involves parts of those chondrules turning into clay like materials. And absolutely. Be, as, as these things are, are sort of strewn through an accreted chondrite, one can certainly imagine that aqueous alteration occurred before accretion into a stone. Thank you. That's beautiful, dude. You can see five, uh, you guys can do a freeze frame here, but there, I, I count five bleach chondrules. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. In that one right there. Awesome. Thank hey, you, Tucker. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. That's, that's some really, really gorgeous stuff. And if we recall, like just a, a callback for Meteorite 101, when we're talking about the, he mentioned that one is a 3.05. That yes. is as pretty much dang near close to perfect as you can get. Perfect yeah. being an unaltered by heat and, and water would be a 3.00. And that's right. different than a three point, than just an, a, a three. So if you have an L3, that's not as special as an L.3. L3.00. Mm, Does that yeah. mean it's been subtyped and it, it is actually zero, zero, no, no alteration. Whereas three, an L3 would encompass the entire thing from a 0. 0. 0.00 all the way to a 9.999, whatever. Yeah. And, and certainly there, you know, the, the, the criteria for the lower subtypes are relatively new. And certainly there are a number of L3s and LL3s out there which could classify for, for subtype. There are some out there that are labeled without the subtype that are probably eligible. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one last little tidbit, this, the three, LL3.05 is an order of magnitude less dollars per gram, actually a little more than an order of magnitude than LL3.00. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's like the brand new Lamborghini that you just drove off the lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you, uh, awesome. thank you so much pat i really appreciate that um yeah. let us switch over to art wagner in the house i have a uh, polymet eucharite that's nwa 11704 and it's 11.9 grams uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of dark the matrix is kind of dark but there's uh definitely more than one lithogy going in on mm -hmm. that it definitely got uh, a hole and the light is not uh accenting the hole oh yeah not there it is gone black <laughs> yep mm -hmm. it does have a class of lith lithogy here then uh i believe in with that where that hole is. I can't say that there are three types, but at, at least identify two. I wish mm -hmm. it was lighter in its color of the internal ma matrix of, of the slice, but unfortunately, this one happens to be on the darker side. I would 
venture a guess as the reason maybe why that would be darker is as, as a polymic. Um, yep. You have a bunch of different stones all combined into one. It's, I just think that there would be a lot more melting that, that goes along with that rather than rocks of the same type that would be smashed together. Maybe they would smash together more uniformly and wouldn't pulverize the stuff in the middle and cause that dark melting. Yes. That, well, that's just my two cents, but that's that's a beautiful uh, poly McEuchre right, right there. Yeah, and guess who guess who I purchased it. <laughs> <laughs> thank thank you so much. Appreciate yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Appreciate you. you showing and telling today. Meteorite news. <laughs> okay, I have a few pictures here of hammer events. It's hammer time, guys. But. Yeah. That uh, car is one that I've, that seat is one that I've actually seen. That is a photo of a display at the Chicago Field Museum. Is that the Missouri car that was struck? It's the one that was in a barn, I think. It was hit yeah, it was, and it starts with a B. In, in a garage, yeah. I, sorry, I, I, I don't remember more of the details, but yeah. I saw that, that seat cushion with a big old hole in, in the muffler. So... It, it hit the muffler and bounced off the muffler through the car seat. This is one that came through a house, obviously. This is another one that came through a house. It came through here and bounced off a few things, impacted on the wall, and came to rest right there. So how cool is that? Um, on the next page, I just, I just want to discuss hammer stuff because we don't, you know, it's exciting and it doesn't happen very often, so we might as well talk about it. What do you guys see on this page? Winch comb. There you go. Peak skill. Yep. Peak skill down at the bottom. Not only yep. do we have um, captured video of it, it's a witnessed hammer one, you know? So, and there's the actual meteorite with the red paint from the car. Mm -hmm. So, my God, if you have a slice of peak skill with the red paint on it. <laughs> Is anyone familiar with the one over there on the right hand side? cartersville house no this one i actually gave credit where credit's due because i have no idea what this one is but it actually came through the roof and ricocheted and landed right there on the floor so i maybe... think that's a display from the field museum too but i'm not certain mm. well, we all have research to do yep <laughs> did you hear about this one yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I guess from, from what I've heard, and you, if anyone does anyone know details of this? Well, initially there was there was a lot of people poo poo in this, but uh, the last that I've heard is that the meteorite is at uh, a university lab in uh, in uh, eastern Canada, someplace. It's, Being, it's at it's at a place called Western University. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, so it it's legit. Mm -hmm. Um. Does anyone know the story of Ruth Hamilton? No. Well, I know I know that they initially thought that it was uh, possibly construction blasting. So the police checked with the construction company and they weren't working that day. So they didn't want to just jump to conclusions saying it was a meteorite right away. So I, I know that part of it. Uh, but it landed within a few inches of her. I, I totally want to get... okay. The, I also know that she called 911 when it happened. She was like 11, it was 11.05 at night or something like that. And yeah. she was asleep in bed. She's a retiree. Um, her dog started barking. She heard a loud explosion and looked up and the roof was, was broken. So she called 911, not knowing what was going on. And th supposedly there's a recording of her saying, oh my God, it's a meteorite. <laughs> I am going to scour the internet until I have that audio. And it's going to be the opener to all my videos from now on. Oh my God, it's a meteorite. <laughs> but I guess it was, it was a, a pretty scary event um, for her. And there's the meteorite right there. Uh, it would definitely be a, a very uh, scarce event and scary event. Um, Professor Brown of the University of Western Ontario said that uh, the odds of getting a bed hit in any given year is about one in a hundred billion. Wow. So, Time to buy a lotto ticket. Yeah. yeah so it hasn't happened at my house yet. Dang it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Even so. if you paint a target on your roof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just, I'm just a large meteorite wants to come and nail my piece of crap truck in the front yard. Go right ahead. Let me back my wife's car out first and then just nail it because I'm it done. <laughs> yeah. So um, is, is it just the single stone that's been found or has anybody found anything else? No, fall? good, good question. Another stone has been found uh, within a mile of her house. And those are the only two. Uh, I mean, that stone could have get... killed her. Yeah. You know, I mean, if that had hit her in the head, that she would have been dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that would have she, made the rock more expensive. Absolutely. <laughs> I I ethically have no comment on that. <laughs> absolutely. Um, she said she was glad that the meteorite came down because it's making her appreciate her life so much more. Oh, that's nice. So. Yeah. She mm-hmm. I, I guess she's good. she's keeping it um and wants to give it to yeah. her grandkids. Did so. anyone uh get the Doppler radar returns for the area in case there is a large strewn field involved? Um, I know that there was, that the, uni- the, u- the nearby university, uh, Western Ontario, they're about an hour away. So they drove an hour to, to her house, and that's where they used the information to find another piece. Wow. So I don't know if there's active searches going on. I know Fred uh, was lucky enough. He's been at the university part of the being a part of the study of this meteorite so who's that fred, fred, um, fred that's what yeah fred that's fred. what kevin said too fred knows some people there so hopefully we'll yeah. hear some insider information next week yeah oh, hey guys awesome. i uh i joined a little late kevin debo here oh <laughs> hold on a second hey, kevin. Excellent. excellent there we go <laughs> joined a little late i know our time zones are a little off me being here in the eastern part of canada so um i joined a little late fred mcpherson i talked to him today he said that he's going to be going to western university to see the meteorite itself nice. um he said that when he gets more information on everything he doesn't know exactly when he's going to be going to see it but when he does he would like to talk about his experience on the video hangout You are more than welcome, my friend. Um, Western University is in London, Ontario. This meteorite fell in British Columbia, so Mm -hmm. not necessarily close. I'm thinking Mm -hmm. maybe the was the University of Calgary you might be talking about. Oh, thank you. Was an hour away. I'm totally open for correction on anything I've said today or ever. But yeah, um, but one in a hundred billion chance of a meteorite going through your roof and landing beside you on your bed. Yeah. Oh. That just unbelievable. And have you heard? Hopefully, we'll find out more background of whether you know she's going to make a donation of it to the lab at the university, and then keep the rest for her for her grandkids. And that would yep. be honestly their retirement fund. Like, there's collectors that will pay for that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I hope, yeah. hope it's available that uh, to get a piece of it one day. But uh, it's definitely a great <laughs> meteorite. For now, yeah. she wants to keep it for herself. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. she was, one of the jokes in the newspaper was she was hoping that her home warranty covered cosmic events. <laughs> and I basically want to reach out to her, like, I don't want to be that guy, but like any debris, any splinters, any drywall. She's like, yeah, I had drywall all over me. I'm like, oh, you collect it. <laughs> well, uh, did you have that any uh, more uh, any more tidbits of, of insider information for us besides an update from um, uh, Fred McPherson, our crew member? <sighs> Nothing that I caught late. Um, that sounds like you got everything. The uh, yeah. Professor Brown, yeah, you stated that the odds of that happening is like a one in a hundred billion, which is pretty and crazy. It looks like it's likely going to be an OC chondrite, so. Mm-hmm. Um, no official classification yet, obviously, but as far as I know, it's at Western University and uh, it's getting analyzed right now. Hmm. Awesome. Well, that's great. So how yeah. long will that take? How long will it take? Yeah, it, like how long does that normally take? It, it takes how long more. would a normal chondrite take? Probably about three to four to six months. How much will this? How long will this one take? About three weeks. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Yeah, um, scientists obviously want to spend their time working on interesting uh, samples, either scientifically interesting and things that will develop their 
area of study. Most most every meteoritocyst dedicates their life to studying meteorites, but it's such a wide field that each one has their niche or what they do, whether they're the Martian guy, whether they're the oxygen isotope lady, whether they're this or that, uh, whatever kind of things they're into or interest them, they want to classify that sample if it furthers their area of interest personally. So that's a really easy way to get something classified in a hurry is find something that that classifier is studying and what is what are they writing their papers on and then find a sample that talks to that <clears throat> classifier personally they're more apt to push that up the ladder when you have something like this a national event you know it's it's going to get classified right quick like i mean the usually you don't have the university come to your house to collect samples i'll just put it like that yeah <laughs> that shows yeah. the preferential treatment going on here and and it will be classified rather quickly um now when it will be published on the met bowl is another thing that will take a uh, another amount of time as well yeah all right so kevin's checking in live with us the proobies here <laughs> well back on the topic of the meteorite that fell in the woman's roof in Canada. This is roughly the same size as the chondrite that fell through her roof. And uh, imagine this thing falling through your roof and landing in your pillow while you're trying to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I, that is crazy. Yeah, it's 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 fist size. Like it's it's. Do you, what is the weight of that? This one's 1.7 kg. I know that one's 1.3 kg. So this mm -hmm. is this is a little larger, but um, mm -hmm. it's the closest I had for reference. But I mean, it's pretty hefty. And if that thing was coming 30,000 miles an hour through your roof, it's yeah. not going to be good. <laughs> That's the ultimate wake up call. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. That's amazing. Th thanks for sharing that with us, buddy. I totally yeah. appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, we're checking in with one of our three international crew members. Um, this is Maxime, and he is showing us some eucrites in this collection and just the wide variety of textures and matrices uh, that are displayed in the eucritic family. So from Belgium, take it away, Maxime. Hi, Toffer. Hi, everyone. Maxime here from Brussels. I hope you are all doing good. For today's hangout about eucrites, I prepared a small video during which I will review some of the eucrites I have in my collection, so let's go. The first specimen I wanted to show you is this slice of NWA 13787, an unbrecciated coarse-grained eucrite with a perfectly basaltic look. Look at that. I obtained this slice from Mirko Grohl from Germany. That's the basaltic texture then. Mm -hmm. Next comes NWA 13149, an ophitic textured eucrite. Wow. Look at that. On one of the end cuts I have, you can even see some fusion crust. Beauty. Oh, yeah, yeah. This one is NWA 12468. This specimen is the main mass I bought from Pierre-Marie Pelé from France. This one is brecciated and presents some metal-rich clasts. Its desert varnish is really interesting too, and there is even a small spot where a clast seemed to have been half melted. That's the main mass, I love it. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that big feature. Absolutely. The next one is known for its very shiny fusion crust, Camel Donga. This little fragment also shows some interesting white inclusions in its matrix. Look at that shine. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. During the making of this video, I also noticed this little melted green inclusion here which looks really nice. Oh, nice. Then comes the one we don't need to introduce anymore, mm -hmm. Gurara 3, which probably has the most beautiful fusion crust I've ever seen. Thanks again to Toffer for those amazing specimens. 
No problem, buddy. Look at that. Gorgeous. <laughs> mm -hmm. That fusion crust is casting shadows. <laughs> Next, I kept the, the best for the end. Maybe you remember this very strange looking unbreached Ukraine I introduced to you some weeks ago, NWA12516. Well, I really fell in love with this slice and decided it was time for me to go for a slight improvement and get a slightly bigger slice. And here it is. Oh, I obtained oh. this big 28.8 gram slice from Mirko Grohl from Germany, who is the main mass holder for this NWA. Look at that wonderful matrix. Wow. Yeah. Every week we fall in love with a different type of meteorite. You realize that, guys? Mm hmm. Coloration on that's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Absolutely. I want to know more about what makes the texture that way. And lastly, here are some various videos of other Ukrites I have, just to show how diverse this incredible class is. That shock vein running through that one? I think that is more of a weathering crack, or off the very, very top, perhaps. Okay. But the majority of those are weathering cracks. Okay. Or, or just material cracks. Nice thick slice. Mm -hmm. yep. Look at those white clouds. Look at that big old black thing sitting there. Reminds me of the surface of the moon. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a beautiful slice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's got to be, uh, well, I'm going to look it up, but that looks like a polymic to me. Look, whoa. Here we go. Wow. Yeah. So these are differentiated material. When we talk about meteorites, these are differentiated achondrites. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was, that was a very pleasant... Uh, visit man really really, really yeah. quick um that looks Mirko like has a little bit at first. The main so that's it for today i hope you enjoyed the video and see you very soon nwa13516 on ebay right now it's not even four figures either wow <laughs> all right we love fresh falls here on the Knowledge Bolide, but we also like historic falls and historic information. So let's check in with our member in the northern quadrants of North America. Jeff, how are you, buddy? Doing good. I'm enjoying the beach right now. <laughs> <laughs> Those Canadian beaches of October. We're, we're, getting, we're, getting, we're getting ready for some snow, so I thought I'd change it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I wanted um, to share this one uh, with you. This is Jovanis. This is a, a Ukraine um, out of uh, France. It uh, fell in uh, on uh, June 15th of 1821. And I was able to pick up a, a 650 milligram uh, specimen here. And um, uh, Mike kind of inspired me to dig into uh, the history on this a little bit. And took me a, a, a while to, um, to find the actual original paper on this as far as the write-up from, uh, what the heck was it, 1822 out of the Annals of Philosophy. So it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to think that way back when um, a lot of science stuff was uh, related more to the philosophy side of things as opposed to the actual scientific side of things. So um just wanted to show here so yeah so this fell roughly a little over 200 years ago the anniversary was this year actually um and what's interesting if you did you guys want to hear the the original i guess four paragraph write-up on this as far as the historical account absolutely man that's why we're here yeah. all righty 
Cool. Sounds good. Because like I say, this was interesting to find on the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. So okay. um, so I'll just start here. So we, mayor of the commune of Javanis, Cotton de Antregis, or Aaron Dosamite de Previs, Department de la Ardish, report that on the 15th of this present June, warned by a frightful noise, which was heard in our commune, and those which surround it, about three o'clock in the afternoon, we apprehended that some great and extraordinary event was about to take effect, a general destruction in nature, which obliged us successfully to adopt regulations to satisfy us that no one in our jurisdiction had been the victim of the phenomena which first appeared to be inexplicable. At length, after some days had elapsed, we were informed that a meteor, of which history furnishes no similar account, had burst upon the mountain de Loelet de in the hamlet of Cross de la Buenes, forming part of our commune. And according to Delmay, who is 70 years of age, its appearance was preceded and announced by two strong explosions occurring nearly together, resembling the discharges of two large cannons and followed by a frightful noise that continued for more than 20 minutes which spread alarm and con consternation amongst the inhabitants who believed they should be immediately swallowed up by some abyss ready to open up under their feet. The flocks <laughs> fled and the goats and sheep collected in groups. At the same time, a black mass was seen coming from behind the mountain de la Ouellette, describing as it descended in the air, a quarter of a circle and sinking into the hollow of the valley of Libanese. This remarkable circumstance was scarcely perceived by anyone but children who less alarmed than more competent persons would have been followed the direction and have since pointed out the exact spot where this mass was swallowed up. Wow. Delme adds that he heard in the air a confusion of voices which he thought were at least 500 devils and whom he considers <laughs> as the agents that transported this alarming phenomenon. <laughs> At the moment, he said to Claude Vays, one of his neighbors, who, like himself, was in the fields, do you hear? Do you understand the language of these people? This person <laughs> replied, frankly, I do not comprehend them. But they were both persuaded that this mass was carried by infernal spirits. <laughs> Delmay, for the latter reason, said to Vesey, we have only time for one act of contrition, cast his eyes on the ground, bowed his head, and tranquilly waited for death. Such was the contrination of all the witnesses of this terrible event, that according to their confessions, they fancied they already saw the mountains rolling and heaping upon them. The alarm was such that it was not till the 23rd of the month, so eight days after the fact, that they resolved to dig out this prodigy, in which they knew neither the form, the nature, or the substance. They deliberately for a long time whether they should go armed to undertake this operation, which appeared so dangerous, but Claude Sari Sexton justly observed that if it was the devil, neither powder or arms would prevail against him, that holy water would be more effectual, and that he would undertake to make the evil spirit fly, after no. which they set themselves to work, and after having sunk nearly six feet, they found the aerolite weighing rather more than 202 pounds. Wow. It was covered with a black bitumous varnish, and some parts of it had a sulfurous smell. It was requisite to break it to get it out. There still remains a mass weighing about 100 pounds. <laughs> so all the facts above stated are proved by all the inhabitants of the hamlets of Lebanese, and especially Delma, saint and jeune James and Claude Serre, Peter Jury, John Chedoir, Anthony Dumas and his <coughs> child, and also by Mary Ann Vidal and a young girl about 14 years of age. The two latter, who were less frightened, followed the direction of the stone and actually found the place where it was buried. Concerning all which we have drawn up the present prisma verbal on the continuation of the history of this phenomena, a copy of which we shall send to M the Perfect, drawn up and agreed up by the house on the 25th of June of 1821. So I thought it was kind of interesting. Again, a person doesn't necessarily think way back when um, we take science for granted. And, and to think that, again, 500 evil spirits carried this rock from 
from heaven down to earth. And it was the children that were were more interested and unafraid of it than the adults. That's the so, cool part. Yeah. It was it was a cool it, it's a cool little thing. So wow. yeah, so um this particular Ukraine um uh, comes from uh, most likely the, the asteroid of Vesta. Uh, crystallization age is showing about 4.539 billion years. Uh, the cosmic ray exposure analysis uh, shows it has dated about 10 to 12 uh, millennia since it was uh, ejected from Vesta and landed on the Earth here. And I just included here a, a kind of a picture of the, the local area of where this particular meteor, historical meteorite fell. I, I want to ask for one clarification on the bottom. You're talking about two ages. Can you, I don't want to put you on the spot, Jeff, but can you please explain the difference of those ages? The, the crystallization age versus the uh, cosmic ray exposure age. And if not, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So like the, the crystallization age. So with respects to that, that's the actual physical age of the the material itself the meteorite material itself mm -hmm. the cosmic ray exposure age is uh, is basically the determination of how long that that particular meteorite has been exposed to cosmic rays since being ejected from an impact event on where it was embedded to the point of when it landed on the earth perfect thank you so much i appreciate that you betcha so yeah so Roughly about half of this particular meteorite uh, ex exists at the National Museum of Natural History in, in Paris. Um, the rest of it um, <clears throat> basically was used as doorstops and, and whatnot by family members um, that had collected it up after, after the fact. And then over the, over the years, um, passing down from generation to generation, a lot of the materials just being kind of thrown away or, or thrown in the garbage, basically, mm. because family members didn't know what the rocks were, right? So they didn't realize that they were meteorites and what meteorite it was from. So um, getting a, a sample of this particular meteorite um, is is definitely challenging, mm. but mm. is is doable. So, so this, this uh, subgram piece that you have here, this is now your personal piece. You betcha. Have you noticed any evil spirits or any omens in your house? <laughs> I, I've, I've, I, I, the only thing that I've had happen as of late is the uh, clock on the wall fell off, but I, I think I blame my three <laughs> um, and five-year-old jumping up and down upstairs causing that. But <laughs> Because I heard a rumor that this puts a weird spell over people where they lose one hour of their life. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can attest to that. <laughs> oh, Jeff, hey, have you put that thank you so YouTube much, man. I, like I re really appreciate. Do we have any any questions at all besides mine? I, I just threw that one out there. Yeah, Topher, I was going to ask Jeff if he had uh, put his little piece of that under a UV light to see if uh, anything fluoresced. Oh, I nice. have not. No, I'll have to do that. Uh, try a long wave. Uh, okay. uh, actually, both short and long, but I go with the long first. Okay. Nice. All right. All right. We are checking in with our reoccurring Meteorite 101, where we try to delve a little bit deeper into our meteorite knowledge, make sure we're always discovering and learning more. We've talked about this, this chart for weeks, for years, but this is what we're discussing today. We've been talking about the HED group. We did the Diagenites and Howardites. Now we're in the Eukrite group. So we're going to be talking about all these different ones in this group. And with that, we have a small, yeah. So I guess we're going to go right into Mike's presentation. And then uh, afterwards, we're going to take a look at some different examples of the eucritic textures. So as we're going through Mike's presentation, keep Keep an, an open ear for um, different terms and different matrices because we're going to look at different examples coming up. So, Mike, thank you, buddy. Yeah, sure. Uh, so looking at this first slide, uh, obviously you got uh, four Vesta over there on the left. And if you look on the right, I just uh, I like this image. Uh, this is from Barat uh, et al. in 2007. And this really kind of shows a good idea of potentially how the Eucrites formed. Uh, which is you got those ultramafic rocks we talked about in previous sessions, which are your um, diogenites. 
And then you got this residual magma ocean sitting above them and you get these uh, pipes coming up of, of magma that reach the surface and you get volcanic activity on Fort Vesta uh, that produces the Eucrites. Yeah, they're, they're, they're volcanic uh, and some of them are intrusive uh, still. So they are, they're magmatic material that didn't quite totally make it to the surface in some of the instances. Mm -hmm. uh, but they bring up some good points with this little table that... Uh, you know, they got impact metamorphism in there. So if a big impactor comes in uh, and partially melts the rock around there, uh, you'll get secondary um, metamorphism there where the original material will, will gain a bunch of heat and be able to uh, uh, metamorphose a little bit. Uh, you also got contact metamorphism where uh, like a blob of this magma starts to bubble up uh, and doesn't quite reach the surface, but it's cooking all the uh, eucritic material around it. Uh, and then we'll talk about the standard trend eucrites too, which are off on the very right side of this diagram where uh, they don't really form uh, from a magma that the other eucrites formed out of. So, uh, you know, science is working on explaining how do we form these other type of eucrites uh, that have compositions uh, and REE, rare earth element compositions that don't uh, jive with the other types of eucrites. Uh, so this is the history slide. Um, I kind of got a joke in there. They were named after Eucrates. Uh, this is the one meteorites in the head group that are not named after somebody. Um, <laughs> so you had Diogenes, you had Edward Howard for the Howardites. Uh, Eucrites actually come from a Greek word uh, meaning Eucritos, uh, and that means easily distinguished. Uh, oh, wow. So as far as Aralites go, uh, you know, back in the day uh, when uh, Gustav Rose uh, made these a class of meteorites, they stood out from all the chondrites and everything else, uh, and he considered them easily distinguishable. Uh, which is true if you look at other meteorites to mm -hmm. a degree, uh, but you throw them in a big pile of basaltic earth rocks, and if they don't have fusion crush, you might disagree with him. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, e easily distinguishable can, uh, can, can kind of be a double-edged sword. Uh, yeah. Even <laughs> so with some of the meteorites, because uh, some of the eucrites uh, look very much like some of the lunars. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 and, and it's just the composition that has to give it away composition uh oxygen uh, isotopic ratios yeah yeah a lot of that will help you uh take the two groups and, and determine which parent body they're from so this is this is the big breakdown uh like you said there uh as far as the hed's go there are a lot of eucrites uh in metbol as of uh monday there were 1580 total eucrites oh. um and unlike the Diogenites, where you had like two official types of Diogenites, and same thing, the Howardites are only like two or three uh, types of Howardites as far as what Metbull officially says is a, a, a authorized classification, there are 10 subcategories in the Eucrates. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did was I listed them out here. Um, obviously, if they can't dial it down any deeper than just the fact that it's a Eucrite, it just becomes a Eucrite, and there's uh, 538 of those. Uh, and what I did was I kind of put some of the uh, the standout ones in there that are um, somewhat available or even if they're hard to get are cool eucrites. Uh, so Serra Pelota, uh, which is a Brazilian rainforest fall uh, eucrite, is really cool and it's got a crazy looking um, matrix. Um, it looks it looks like it should be a polymic. It's got all different sorts of um, mineral grain size chunks going on in there, uh, and yet it's it's a monomic. It's all the same. Uh, compositionally it's just uh different crystal structures within there so that's a really cool one uh eucrite anomalous is there's 13 of those and again anomalous means it could be anomalous for high metal um slightly variant oxygen isotopic uh there's there's dozens of reasons it could be um uh anomalous so that's everything that has something that's a unique feature to it going on um eucrite breccias uh, 197 of those um Again, it's a large amount. Uh, brecciated just means it contains uh, chunks of uh, class of rock in either a fine grain matrix of powder rock or uh, even just mineral fragments as, as the matrix. Um, then you got the eucrite cumulates. There's 50 of those. Uh, and a eucrite cumulate is kind of where we get interested. You know, at the beginning, I kind of said, hey, these are basalts. And that's a very loose definition because when you start to get to the cumulates, what those are are um, bits that um, solidified out of the magma pocket early and either sank or floated up based on their density. Um, and so they had a longer time to form. A lot of times they form deeper. 
And that means that their texture is actually not really like a basalt. A basalt is a very fine grain texture. Uh, these will have more coarse grained um, minerals inside of them. And so they're really more like a, like what on earth we'd call a gabbro. Um, but there, right. there are 50 of those. Um, Moore County is one of them. And also uh, Sierra Damage is a, it's another pretty famous one. Uh, you'll see those come up very rarely, but they're they're cool ukrates to have. Um, ukrate melt breccia is exactly what it sounds like. The the matrix of that material is from a melt. Again, uh, on that first slide I kind of showed, you can get impact melts where a big impactor will come in and, and melt the local region. Uh, and so the the matrix around all the different breccia class inside of that meteorite uh, is, is actually like a glassy or vitreous uh, melted material. Uh, and there's 52 of those. Uh, Eucharite, magnesium rich. Uh, again, there's only three of those. They're all Antarctic. Have fun with that. You ain't getting them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think they are all uh, all banned. Um, that is and cool. Just to be clear, Mike, the numbers, the first number is a total representation in the Met Bowl. Then the second number represents witnessed uh, falls. falls. Yeah. Sorry. And I... then, yeah. So so obviously in Antarctic, there's none. Um, no one is false. Okay. Thank Although you. when the first one of those happens, that's a lucky uh, yeah. Azmet team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Um, yeah, you create monomix. So uh, uh, monomix is a material where all of the components inside of the meteorite are all genetically related. So they're all this, from the same single type of, of rock. Um, and just because something is a monomix doesn't mean it can't be brecciated. Um, it can be the same bit of rock that's been broken up and then relithified together, but it basically means you're sampling material from one distinct location that hasn't really been mixed up uh, with other type of material. Um, and yeah, there's uh, 256 of those, 18 falls. That's where the majority of your falls are, is, is the Ukraine monomix. Uh, and we have Berthoud, which is uh, Colorado, Abelteri, which is a great meteorite with crazy vesicles in it, which you don't usually see. Uh, we already covered uh, Juvenus, which is uh, what's great about that is although a lot of it was lost, that was a Eucrite that made it into a ton of institutional collections. So that kind of spread the Eucrites out uh, for a lot of initial study. I think it went to something like 62 uh, museums or, or major collections. Um, so that's kind of like the Allende of, um, of Eucrites. It, it, nice. it really got the material out there yeah. uh, for study. Uh, it got, like I said, got broken up into a whole bunch of little pieces from an initial, I think, 90 mm -hmm. kilograms. That. Um, Milbilili, uh, again, uh, famous Australian, uh, readily available in Ukraine, uh, and Stannern, which is uh, the namesake of the Stannern trend, uh, which we'll cover in a little bit. Uh, then you got Ukraine monomix anomalous. There's only one of those. Um, 14, That's a uh, new one. 14, <laughs> 146. Yeah, 2000. 20 uh, was when that one hit the Met Bowl. Um, and although it's a um, it's a, a monomic anomalous, it's anomalous and I guess its uh, composition is closer to, I guess, some of the polymix. Uh, I got to do some more research on that one. It's kind of interesting. Um, but it is, it is its own single item in its class, um, subclass. Uh, then you get the polymix. And we kind of talked about those a little bit when we were talking about the um, the Howardites, again, these are kind of the equivalent of a regolith breccia. So these would be the top little bits that are sitting on the uh, the Ukraine material. Uh, and as impacts happen, they get mixed back up and get little bits of impactor mixed in with them. Uh, and a lot of a lot of brecciation and polymicked um, nature occurs because you're throwing bits and pieces all over the place and mixing it all together and reburying it and uh, solidifying it. Um, and so yeah, there's 360 of those, uh, eight falls, and Passamonte is, is very well known with great fusion crust. Um, not, not a huge, I think it was like five kilograms total. Um, so it's not seen too often, demands a high price, but is a very, very beautiful crust to me, right? I actually uh, saw it at, in New Mexico, and no. uh, it looks like a fusion crusted avocado. Just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's just glassy. It's hard to take pictures of them when you see them. They're just... Yeah. They're, they just reflect so much with the, with all the, the reflected light coming off the crust. They're awesome. Uh, and the last one on there is the Ukraine unbrecciated. So again, that would be a material that hasn't been broken up and reassembled. It's just one solid lithic mass of eucritic material. Uh, and there's 109 of those, two falls, uh, and Tierhurt is is kind of the famous one of those. Yeah, if you can find it. 
Yeah, if you can find it and afford it. Yeah. Um, so looking at the characteristics, so what are these things? Again, we, we said that they're mostly, uh, you know, considered to be basaltic. Um, so they contain uh, mostly calcium poor pyroxene. They contain pigeonite. Uh, and they contain calcium-rich plagioclase. So those are the three kind of major minerals sitting in there. Um, we know they're all related because when you do O-isotopic uh, ratios on them, they all fall in that same kind of region uh, as, as when they're plotted. Uh, and they all, for the most part, have a similar set of ratios for some of their, their chemical uh, compositions. So like the iron to magnesium ratio uh, is, is the same. Uh, on the majority of, of the minerals in there. Um, again, we touched on the differences a little bit too. So again, you, you know, you typically think of these as volcanic. So being extrusive, exploding out of the, uh, the surface of four Vesta and being a laid down material that flows over the surface. Um, but there are cumulates. So again, those are deep magma chamber type material that cooled and solidified before it was uh, ejected. Um, and some of the interesting things is that the, the magma that formed those cumulates, um, they've had a tough time kind of running the chemistry through to make it um, blend in with what comes out and forms the non-cumulates. Uh, so again, there's a couple different theories out there. I showed that kind of magma ocean and, and pipes leading up to the surface, but there's different theories out there that kind of help to try to address, um, you know, how you get these different compositions that don't uh, make a smooth curve uh, and kind of show a relation that what solidified in the magma pipe would be the same as what erupted on the surface. Um, Mike, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. The three main components are calcium poor pyroxene, and, and I'm looking at the calcium rich plasticlase. When you look at both of those, it's kind of they kind of contrast each other. You have calcium poor and calcium rich. Is there mineral um, replacement going on there? So when you have like a magma, what, what actually happens is you get fractionation, right? So you're going to form stuff that uh, falls out first, right? So as you start, let's say, having a high calcium magma, right, and you get the pyroxenes to start coming out. Um, and I'm um, sorry, I started getting like the, like the plagioclase to come out, for instance. You get the, the calcium is getting uh, absorbed or, or pulled out of that liquid mixture and bonded into the minerals, right? So as you start to go your ratio of calcium and silicates left is is different and that's why you start to get stuff like calcium poor pyroxene and even as you start forming mineral grains and we'll talk about this a little bit uh when we talk about uh some of the other eucrites um even within the crystal grain as things are changing in that magma mix you'll get differences between the core of a, of a mineral grain and the edge of a mineral grain mm -hmm. as far as what the composition is um, and that's based on how long the mineral had, uh, you know, time to form as that magma composition changed. And that can also be from that secondary um, metamorphism, right? So mm -hmm. let's say a large heating event happens next to that, right? A yeah. big impact or, a, or a, a magma mass comes next to an already solidified rock and produces a lot of heat, get that what's called contact metamorphism. Um, then what will happen is, you know, the chemical compositions uh, in those mineral grains and the mineral grains right next to them can start to kind of equalize or uh, equilibrate. So you all, you all see on one of the other slides, we have highly equilibrated um, eucrites and non-equilibrated eucrites. And we also have ones that have just been completely metamorphosed and recrystallized. Mm -hmm. um, so Jeff kind of talked about the age, you know, that, that formation age. Um, there's formation age and sometimes that gets wiped out um, and, and reset. Uh, by something like metamorphism going on where the, the minerals reassemble and regrow basically in solidus. So without necessarily melting all the way, um, just by being really hot and allowing those uh, ions to move around within there and change. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so last slide, the cool facts. Uh, this is where I was kind of touching on. We, we talked on Passamonte. So Passamonte is um, really cool because it is, um, one of the, uh, the most unaltered, uh, eucrites, right? So it's unequilibrated. Um, so mm -hmm. as you can see, uh, if you, if you look, uh, I, they broke it down by three different types of crystals. Uh, and 
you don't need to necessarily understand the numbers there, but uh, what they did was they used uh, backscatter electron uh, microscopy, uh, and they looked at the calcium, magnesium, and iron content in the core of the crystal, and then kind of moving out along towards the edge uh, to see how the composition of those three elements changed. Um, and you can kind of see that what happens is the, the calcium increases as you go from the core of the crystal towards the edge, uh, and the magnesium uh, number drops and the iron number increases, right? So there's a lot of variance between the, the composition at the core of the, that single grain of crystal uh, and its edge. Now, if that was exposed to uh, metamorphic type heat levels, what happens is it allows the ions to kind of blend and, like I said, reach equilibrium. Uh, so you'll hear those uh, re-equilibrated. Re um, and then last slide, uh, talk about this kind of on that first slide a little bit. So there are um, two main groups of eucrites. If you look at them by what their composition is, uh, you got the main group eucrites and then you got those standard uh, trend eucrites. Um, and if, if you look at the chart on the right side here, basically they looked at the lanthium content uh, versus the total iron oxide content in there. And as you plot those uh, against each other, what you realize is that the standard meteorites all plot in one area and the main group meteorites all plot in another. Um, and again, just like with those cumulates, not, you know, necessarily having a great way to show that they come from the same magma body as the non-cumulates, the standard trend eucrites, you can't make that composition out of the same magma that the main group uh, formed from. And so what they think happened is they think that there were these certain melt pockets within uh, the deep crust of Vesta. And as one of these tubes of magma came up towards the surface, it went through these other melt pockets and, and blended and mixed together with some of the, the material in those, those liquid pockets uh, and introduced other uh, rare earth elements and things like that into the mix. And that's how you got these standard trends. So there's like seven of those um, that I've run across in research papers, um, and they don't you know, they don't play well with the other eucrates. Um, and kind of the, the two ones that you'll find out of there that you can get every once in a while are Stannard and Bubonte. So. What what mineral is plotted on the left hand side? Uh, it's actually it's not a mineral. It's uh, it's lanthium. It's uh, element. An element. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, element so yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Do we have uh, any questions for our presenter today. I was just going to say the uh, a lot of them uh, besides the pigeonite have uh, a, uh, a feldspar plagioclase and so now any of those that are showing that are going to be equilibriated is that correct? Well the, the content doesn't necessarily mean that they've equilibrated all the way. It's just a different um, compositional mix that they started out as. The equilibration is kind of looking at the crystal grains next to each other uh, and what the composition is from the cores outwards to the edges. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And on the equilibrium, they'd be the same throughout rather than different on, on the perimeter. So. Yes. Oh. We have a, uh, a guest video from Damian in Croatia, and I forgot to, uh, well, we're using an older version of this presentation. It doesn't have his pictures on there, but uh, we can chat through this because I don't believe there's any audio, but he shows different um, textures and, and eucritic patterns and just beautiful photography. Mm -hmm. See how thin the fusion crust is? It's easily distinguishable, Mike said. Mm. That white stuff is the plagioclase and the green stuff is the peroxide. Mm -hmm. Look at that. That's That looks very dramatic compared to the other ones. Sure. Where would the pigeonite be on these? You'd have 
trouble making it out. I mean, it's it's going to look like uh, a lot of the other, kind of like White Crystal Grange. You got to get it under a thin section. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. Uh, so that's the cumulate that, that forms lower. Mm. Wow. <laughs> He just keeps zooming. It's crazy. So it's rare to get metal in uh, in Ukraine. Would the metal come from the impacting body, probably? Then that's the hypothesis. No, no, not with those oh. because they're cumulates, so they're they're pretty deep. No, oh. so chances are it's it's not necessarily a uh, an impactor drive metal. Thank you. Do they know <laughs> enough about the uh, uh, parent body's uh, metallic core that they would be able to identify the you know, metal from that core? Magmatic metal, is that present in Vesta? Um, there is metal there. I don't think they have. Uh, a tie-in with the core between that and one of the irons. I don't think they got hit hard enough to, to push that type of material out. Yeah, it's probably just vest in metal. This is uh, air. This is nicknamed air chocolate. Now you can know why. Yeah. <laughs> so look, look at the white. Even though they're English, easily distinguishable. Do you see all those different uh, different textures mm -hmm. and different looks? That's awesome. Yeah, very, very different textures. Yeah. Uh, now we actually have Marco, and he's not talking oriented today. He's talking <laughs> about Ukraine. <laughs> so let's check in with Marco in Germany. Hello, everyone. Hi from Germany. I hope you're all doing good, and I hope you have fun at the Hangout. Yeah, today's topic are Ukraine, and I prepared some. So come on, let's have a look on some stones from Vesta. Nice. Have fun. Yeah, guys, let's start with the first piece for today. That's uh, also an acquisition from the Munich show this year. Um, it is um, a 74.2 gram, actually unclassified Ukraine, but um, the seller where I bought that piece, said that it is um, under classification. Beautiful. Yeah, maybe you can uh, imagine why I bought this piece, because, uh, yeah, it's a little bit weathered, that stone, but if you have a look here on those ragmaglyphs and the preserved fusion crust on that side, oh, I would say this piece is most probably oriented. Mm -hmm. So not only a very Nice u but also an oriented piece. Okay. Yeah, as I said, the piece is um, weathered, but there's still um, some regions with uh, glossy fusion crust, residual um, glossy fusion crust, and I think that makes that piece very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we're looking on the back side of the stone. And here you can see the typical Eucritic structure with the plagioclase and pyroxene um, crystals and clasts. What is really interesting on that piece is that um, I would say it's most probably um, a melt because here on that region, you can see here, we don't have uh, any fusion crust on the back side, but in that region, you can't see any structures. So it um, looks a little bit like a melt. And here, if we have a look on that region here, you can see it. You definitely yeah. can see the Eucritic structure. Mm. Mm. Every piece tells a story, man. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the next piece that I want to show today is this glossy fusion crusted beauty here. Any guesses 
which uh, meteorite that it could be? I know. Really? It comes from down under. Mm. Yeah, guys, that's a piece of camel donga. Ah. It weighs <laughs> 22.4 grams. It nice. is 100% crusted and shows that typical glossy black fusion crust, which we all love oh, yeah. so much. Mm. Super glossy and thin crust, too. For those contraction cracks in the crust? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah these also have very glassy crusts. Um, I might that first thing. Mm -hmm. And that goes with either calcium rich or calcium poor. I never can remember. Oh, that's beautiful. Here, last but not least, I want to show you this piece here. This is NWA 10639. It's a monomic eucrite, and you're looking actually on the main mass of that piece there of go. that meteorite. Uh, yeah. So the stone is, um, I would say, 50% crusted. The crust is a little bit weathered, so not so glossy as the crust of uh, the camel donga, for example. But the interior of the stone is really fresh and shows the typical monomic eucrite structure. Mm -hmm. So the creamy, dreamy eucrite, yeah, there we as Topher says. Dreamy. Yeah, guys, I have to show you this side of the stone. <laughs> Ooh. I'm not sure. What do you think? Is that a rollover lip? Uh, my first Maybe thought. it's a fragment of an oriented eucrite. Not sure about mm. that, but maybe. What I really like on that side are the contraction cracks. Mm -hmm. The stone weighs, uh, by the way, 232 gram, and the complete mass was 270 grams. Oh, he's got the whole thing. So, wow. yeah, that's the main mass of that stone. Yeah. Yeah. That is gorgeous. Beautiful. Wow. Yeah. A lot of texture on that crust. That's fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Another main mass. And while we have uh, while we have Pat there, we'll just go ahead and say that. Uh, I, in my opinion, is yes, that shows that's a sign of orientation. But as Pat always says, it's a sliding scale. So it may not be an oriented piece necessarily, but it shows signs of orientation, at least on that one um, part. So. Yeah, guys, these were the three Eucrites that I wanted to show you today. Um, I can't wait to see the Hangout, to see all your other nice Western basaltic materials. <laughs> So uh, from now, I wish you a fantastic hangout. Have fun, guys. And then see you next week. Bye-bye from Germany. See you, Marco. Bye. See you. Right on, man. Yeah, good, good times, man. That was a great awesome. video. That was our international check-in with our all-stars. So thank you guys so much. Some really good, uh, really good media there, as well as some really good education with, um, with uh, Mike. So thank you very much. We are going to do a very abbreviated show and tell session today because we are running super long, but I wanted to show this to you guys and see what you thought of it. Mm. Oh. And whoops, I gotta get both hands in there. Look at that. Pretty. Is is it gonna focus? There we go. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Beautiful glassy crust. Mm-hmm with the orange uh, from down under on it. Yeah, nice get a, patina. A millibilly. Millibilly. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 5.7 grams. And I'm blanking out on the, uh, on the classification of it right now. It's a uh, monomict. So they're all the similar stone crunched in there. But mm -hmm. just a really cool example with the glossy flow covered by the Australian patina. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. 
Yeah, that's the newest newest piece in my collection right there, guys. So yeah. th this right. uh, this allows me these uh, subjects of the week allow me to add an item to my collection as well. So it gives me another excuse or reason to purchase a meteor. Like I actually need one. <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, Pat. We're going to kick it over to you for a second because we had a, a, a viewer question, and I kind of tweaked the viewer question to, to answer a question that I had as well. And we talk all day long about the scarcity of meteorites, question, but, basically but we also we have running out you know, of meteorites? kilos and kilos and kilos available to us. Are, are, you know, who's lying to who or how lucky are we? Pat? <laughs> so uh, this is a... a ...looks at, at the data and at the uh, literature. In short, the classifications from 2011 to 2021 that are in the Met Bowl uh, amount to an average of 1,187 meteorites per year. Uh, if you go back another 11 years uh, from 2000 to 2010, the average was 2,586. So we've been roughly half the number of meteorites classified in the last 11 years is in the previous 11 years. Um, but there are a whole lot of other factors uh, in here as well. Uh, you know, there are more collectors now than there ever used to be. And I kind of have a bit of a unique perspective in that I've been collecting since the late 80s. And so uh, I've been able to observe the market for some time. The rate of recovery in Northwest Africa has been very high, but it's not tapped out. There's still amazing stuff coming out of there. And there are some untapped areas. So in the Atacama Desert, mm -hmm. where it's super dry, meteorites are preserved for an unusually long period of time, uh, easily in excess of a million years. Uh, and so there, there are meteorites that will uh, come from there. And, and they're uh, just recently becoming part of our, of our supply market. But you know, no strewn field is ever hunted out. Northwest Africa will never, ever be hunted out. Um, there is a change in the ecosystem too, and in, in the market as well. There's a whole lot more with you know with Facebook and such. There's a whole lot more direct marketing of meteorites to collectors from the the finders uh, or an early middleman in uh, Northwest Africa. So in in general, there are fewer uh, middlemen than there used to be. Um, prices are going up, and that's really you know about supply and demand. People's awareness of meteorites is way up after the Meteorite Men shows on TV and other things that have been in the news recently. The knowledge um, light on YouTube. <laughs> yes, one of the factors. Um, and, and also, um, I think we're doing a much better job of recovering uh, fresh falls, uh, observed falls. Uh, there are many more meteorite cameras than there used to be, and, and there's a, a worldwide um, awareness of meteorites and unfortunately kind of focuses on their value, their monetary value, but that's how things get in our hands. So that's what I've got. Thank you, Tepper. Awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, part of the uh, part of the reasoning of it was, in my mindset, if we're going to simplify it down to its base elements, the let's go back and say meteorites that landed on Earth in the last million years that have fallen in friendly places to them can still be mined and collected. Well, we're digging them up faster than they fell. So eventually that million year repository is going to be exhausted. And um, it really like, it brought to my attention, like I have a super, super fresh fusion crusted Martian. I don't know when they're going to be digging up another Martian in the desert. So besides one being witness to fall, and picking it up. And it, I, I don't know when I'm going to have a chance to have fusion crusted covered Mars of that quality. But then again, any witness Martian, you just 10 times the price right there. So mm -hmm. instead of, you know, $300 a gram, you're talking 3,000 to 5,000 a gram. So now, now you're not going to have it. So um, <laughs> it's just, just an interesting way to think about, you know, the, the, the scarcity of these items and, and just to, you know, to know that, well, personally, I show them a lot of respect. Uh, I, 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 I do what I can to, to save them uh, when they're distressed. Um, I just sent 30 pounds of iron off to Chris Colvin, and he's going to be reworking those for me. 
So I'm looking really anxious to see what he's able to save and salvage and make beautiful. Uh, our final show and tell of the day is Mr. Mike Kelly. Hey, how's it going? So I only got a couple to show off because I know we're, we're running along. Um, this is by far my favorite Ukrite. Uh, this yes. is Stannern. So this is the first Ukrite ever, first fall. Uh, wow. So it's the oldest of the falls. It's the Stannern trend uh, namesake. And it's also my birthday fall. Oh, my uh, God. So nice. got to have a good piece a, of that. That is a box ticker if there ever was one for yeah. you, man. Yeah. That's a bit of air chocolate. So uh, we already covered okay. that number. But, I mean, <laughs> if you look at that right-hand side, it's absolutely full of little little gas vesicles. That's mm -hmm. crazy, man. Yeah, I yep. couldn't pass that up when I saw how many vesicles were sitting on the, the corner of that thing. Wow. And that was the last one. This is uh, 10674. This is one of those polymink brushes. So, again, this is like the regolith of, of four Vesta, uh, but it's eucritic regolith. Uh, and the crazy thing about this is there's up to 20% uh, H6 uh, chondritic material in there, and there's also up to 2% uh, like CM type material in there. Uh, so it really is a, is a eucrite that's full of uh, impactor. Mm. Is that what give it gives it the anomalous? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The really high content of uh, of, oh, of chondritic material <laughs> inside yeah. of a uh, a chondrite. Wow, that's fantastic, dude. Well, right. I'm so glad we, we did uh, show and tell with you to see Stanton. That's amazing, man. We could have done show and tell for another two hours because I didn't even really bust yeah. into my stuff. And I know we have other stuff. We, we, we have to respect the time and cut off now for the recorded session. We're going to be uh, continuing to hang out with all the cool cats uh, right afterwards. So you on YouTube, you're missing out. You got to join us live. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. See ya. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.